Welcome everybody to uh, San Diego and to the um, spring 2018 uh, CNI member meeting. Um, we have a great turn turnout and I'm delighted to see you all here. I hope you're enjoying uh, San Diego, especially those of you from the um, snowbound um, states uh, over the last uh, few months. Um, it's a nice change. Um, I have a couple of logistical announcements before we get started. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch, by the way, uh, for those of you I haven't met. Um, I'm the uh, director of CNI, and I know based on the new member meeting, we have um, quite a few uh, folks who are at CNI for the first time here. I hope you find this um, this. Uh, participation worthwhile and um, enjoyable. So a couple of quick uh, logistical things. Um, as you can see from your program, all of the meeting rooms that we'll be using um, for the main meeting are on this floor, except for the harbor room, which is on the third floor, the floor above us. It can be reached either by stairs or by the elevator. Um, we will be having uh, meals in the, on the fourth floor, I believe, as well. Um, wireless information is in your packet. Um, we have posted on the message board in front of registration a list of the sessions that we're going to attempt to capture via video. There is one schedule change so far. The, um, Next Generation Repository session, which was originally scheduled um, for um, Friday um, in Plaza AB, has been moved to the Imperial Room on um, the, today at uh, 5 p.m. So um, we will also post a notification of that up on the message board. Sorry about that last minute change. Um, I'd like to take a minute to welcome a new member, by the way. Uh, Middlebury uh, College has joined us, and we're delighted to have them with us. And I think with that, I don't have any more announcements. Um, I gather travel here has been relatively smooth. We're not having any major blizzards, hurricanes, or other things at major air hubs. So that's a nice change of pace as well. So um, let me move on to the main reason we're here and um, introduce uh, Dr. Joan Lippincott, who will be giving the opening uh, plenary. Um, it's very hard for me, in a way, to introduce Joan because um, Joan has been with CNI since the earliest days. Um, she's been our associate director um, since uh, before I got there. And um, her contributions to this organization are just um, incredibly wide, deep, and sustained. Over the last decade or so, she has been practicing a particularly intriguing, complex, kind of multidisciplinary and generous scholarship um, that looks at various interplays between space, organization, um, scholarly practice, uh, it's, it's really a fascinating kind of meld of, of um, approaches. And she's gone very deep into some areas. So some of you will know her work on assessment. Some of you will know her recent work on um, uh, digital scholarship centers. And some of you will be familiar with the deep study she's made of space and organization and how those play together. Today, I think she's going to do something really special, though, um, and that's to open up 
these very deep verticals of her work to all of us through a synthesis, um, a, a sort of a view across all of these um, interplays, um, and one that is centered around the experience of the user. So with that introduction, um, you'd probably much rather hear from her than from me, because I certainly can't do her topic the kind of justice she can. Joan, please take the podium. I'm going to sit down, because you know another thing about Joan? She is way better with visuals than I am, and I want to enjoy hers. <laughs> Welcome, Joan. And I do believe that's the one and only thing I may be better than Cliff at, <laughs> the visuals. Thank you, Cliff, for that gracious introduction. I'm truly delighted to speak with you today on some issues that are particularly meaningful to me and my work at CNI. And in my talk, I'm going to highlight some of the content on the CNI website and how it reflects the ways that we think about and highlight important trends and projects. But I also want you to know how much I valued the input of truly all of you in this room and all of the people who have participated in CNI over the years and also those of you who have invited me to your campus to meet with your community, your fellow information professionals, your faculty, your provosts, and other academic administrators, all of this, you and your communities have really informed my thinking, and I thank you for that. So today my theme is keeping the focus, keeping the user at the center the center of what? The center of the mission of our universities and colleges. Faculty and students are at the center of the core mission of universities, research, teaching, and learning. And as information professionals, we can sometimes focus too narrowly, I believe, on our work and our unit, our, our our primary unit rather than on the university as a whole and implement things in an incremental way that really doesn't always advance what we can do in the most meaningful way. I think it's important periodically to step back and think about why we're doing what we're doing and to really focus on the user community how we can advance research, how we can enhance teaching and learning, and how we can provide links to our community. In each of these areas, our users, our constituents, our students, faculty, and staff, and our community, however that's conceived in your institution, are, should be at the center of your thinking as we develop infrastructure and programs, as we allocate resources, and as we make plans for the future. I'm going to try to illustrate this by focusing on three themes today. Discoverability, teaching and learning, and places and spaces. We've made astonishing progress in making content of all types available on the internet. And by we, I mean the research and education community, universities and colleges, museums, historical societies, and similar institutions. In addition, government entities have provided a wealth of information on the internet, and many are providing content in ways that are openly accessible to the global community. Here on the left, we see some illustrations from the Smithsonian Image Gallery, a selection of book illustrations, photos, drawings, and other images from across the Smithsonian libraries. Most are out of copyright and are available for anyone to use. And on the right, the David Rumsey Map Collection, which focuses on rare 16th through 21st century maps. They began digitizing these in 1996. The physical map collection is located at Stanford. 
One of the features I've always liked, and they've had it for a long time, is the so-called ticker that you'll see at the bottom of the photo. It's one means of browsing the collection as the images march across the screen. I wish more libraries would have such innovative ways of looking at content. The evolution of journal publishing, which was one of the first initiatives of CNI and its member organizations, has also proceeded apace, although perhaps not in all the ways we initially envisioned. Initially, libraries did not fully recognize that they would cease ownership of many journal titles, which are now rented through licensing agreements. They assumed that the move of, to journal content on the internet would result in much broader access to content, which has not necessarily taken place unless you count such services as Sci-Hub or Academia.edu, and I am not recommending those resources. On the other hand, the Directory of Open Access Journals documents the impressive growth of those resources legally available to all. Sources of data have also become increasingly important in the digital world, and you'll see on the right data.gov, which makes available data collected by the US government, the federal government, and tools by which users can uh, analyze that data. But if we step back and think about the enormous varieties of digital content out there on, in so many formats, monographs, journals, images, video, audio, data sets, multimedia objects, 3D visualizations, and on and on. How do we, as information professionals, make sense of all of this information to our user community when they're looking for something? I know that many in the library, information technology, publishing, and information systems community are working hard on this issue. I searched the CNI website, just our own website, not a broad search, uh, using the term discoverability, and I got 89 hits. That's just from things, from mostly from sessions at our meeting. Specific topics included discoverability of items in repositories, of media, manuscripts, biomedical data sets, folklore resources, and techniques such as linked deck data and use of identifiers. Now, I'd like to illustrate more concretely some of my concerns regarding discoverability and keeping the user at the center. So here's an example. A faculty member is preparing a grant proposal to NSF and needs a quick literature review. She wants to just quickly read relevant articles and has little time. She uses Google Scholar and finds 10 articles of high relevance, and she needs them all. So, does she use the library website to identify which she can gain access to and where she can find an openly available preprint if the library doesn't license it? Does she use academia.u or Sci-Hub? What is the most efficient process? What pathways does the library provide that will most easily identify how to get access without fee to items? Does the library know if a preprint will fulfill the researcher's need? And if so, is there a clear-cut way to find that preprint? These are problems that we know about and have studied. Roger Schoenfeld from Ithaca SNR published a report, Meeting Researchers Where They Start, Streamlining Access to Scholarly Resources which literally left my head spinning in confirmation that users are not at the center of most of our discovery systems. At our CNI meetings, we've had briefings comparing preprints and published article texts, and we'll have a panel at this meeting discussing what links the library should provide to versions of content. But at present, there is no standard procedure no common philosophy, no consensus on best practice among information professionals. How do we expect our users to make sense of this environment? 
and many of our users switch institutions where the practices may vary. Here's another example. A student who, and by the way, I just made these up. They're not uh, from anything in particular. A student who graduated last year works in a nonprofit that serves the homeless and wants to read some studies on success rates of different types of education or training programs for the homeless. Many of the college and university library-run information literacy programs still focus on what I call the find three articles in a database process. We maintain that we want to instill lifelong information literacy skills in our students, but will the strategy of teaching students how to find licensed articles in licensed databases truly serve our students when they enter their next phase, their careers, where many are unlikely to have access to licensed resources? At times, the philosophy of, well, we paid for it, so that's what we need to teach students to show these resources are being widely used, seems to go against the longer-term interests in teaching students about the nature of the information environment in their field and the economic factors that govern access to information. Fortunately, some organizations such as JSTOR have made provisions for those without direct ties to an institution to get access to publications under their control. We've had briefings on this program at CNI, and at this meeting, we'll have a session on the needs of independent scholars. Cliff Lynch has written about this issue, and Allison Head touched on it in her plenary session at last spring's meeting. But the bottom line is that this leads me to ask, is our standard mode of teaching students about access to journal articles truly keeping users at the center of our thinking. Even when librarians prepare their ubiquitous lib guides, many prepare what I'd call laundry lists of every conceivable resource in a broad field, rather than something that would more closely model a reference interview. By the way, I prepared those well before it was called lib, they had, they had the product lib guides, so I'm criticizing myself as well. Years ago, I admired a style developed by University of Pennsylvania in their business library, which led users online through a brief set of questions about their topic. And this resulted in a short, often three-title list of where to begin and links to those sources. This may be easier to do in a professional field where there are more defined information topics, but I think we need to have more user-oriented ways of presenting information and guiding people to resources. We also know that searching library catalogs and selecting databases can be confusing and frustrating for many library users, particularly undergraduates. But how many libraries have come up with really creative solutions to address this problem? University of Texas San Antonio described their online chat program in a spring 2016 session at CNI. And I quote, at a time when many libraries continue to experience low reference activity, the University of Texas at San Antonio libraries have seen a 489% increase, yes, 489% increase in two years from 4,600 questions, this is just by their chat reference, uh, reference service, to 27,000 after implementing a proactive, context-sensitive chat system that was created for online businesses. The complexity of these online transactions, they said, is also notably higher than the complexity of questions received at the physical information desk. Here's an example of a student's question. I'm researching corporate power in America with a focus on the political point of view. Which database would be best to use? They also found that faculty were asking questions, which happens very infrequently at physical reference desks these days. Here's an example of a faculty question. I'm looking for respondent level data sets for my students to analyze using SPSS. What do you recommend? 
These are the kinds of interactions that reference and liaison librarians wish they would have more regularly with their constituencies. Are we truly thinking of our user communities and the variations within those communities as we develop the information ecosystem, implement discovery tools, and teach our constituents about them? For me, a former reference instruction librarian, there is a modicum of incoherence of access mechanisms to all types of content and a paucity of real reflection about how we should conceptualize and teach users about how to find scholarly information resources broadly conceived. Content connecting our user community with information is a key way that we support the research, teaching, and learning mission of the university. Discoverability applies to more than finding content. Our user community is full of content creators who need resources as well. Discoverability of things like programs, expertise, and technologies on campus also demonstrates a lack of clear guidance for users. A lack of coherence was an ongoing theme in the work that we did in preparing the paper with ECAR called Building Capacity for Digital Humanities. In this case, availability of and access to networks, storage, specialized software, equipment, digital content, and professional expertise is often administered by various units, many units, which may include central IT, departmental or college IT, libraries, and faculty institutes, such as humanities centers not affiliated with libraries. Often there is no institutional governance structure that assists in determining who has access to what resources, what will be provided for fee or for free, how priorities are developed for support of particular projects, teams, or individuals, who's responsible for the curation of the content created by the projects, and who will fund facilities, equipment, and staff for these various purposes. Just like library content systems, digital scholarship infrastructure and support have often developed piecemeal on campus. In their case, it's often when outside funding or, or targeted internal funding is available or when particular individuals, colleges, or departments or research groups put resources into developing programs, which may or may not be sustainable. This is understandable in the relatively short history of digital scholarship. However, I believe that we're at a point where stepping back and taking a more critical and programmatic look at where we're going and what we're doing in this area is needed in most institutions. Some have implemented robust needs assessments Yale University and University of Pittsburgh were highlighted for their work during the Brown University Digital Scholarship Planning Workshop, which we co-sponsored um, there last September. And at this meeting, University of Houston will be presenting a session, and they did an extensive needs assessment for the development of their digital scholarship program. Many people have a visceral dislike of assessment, but doing some kinds of studies are, in my view, the only way to determine whether your programs are achieving their goals and whether they're genuinely useful to your communities. One model that's gaining some fans and some visibility is the Europeana Impact Playbook, developed to assist all types of cultural heritage institutions in determining the value of their programs. They state that their intent is to collaboratively define the relationship between the things that you do and the impact you expect to achieve. What activities are you deploying? Who do these benefit? How does this make a difference? And how do you measure that? This sounds so simple and so obvious and reflects principles stated by many others. I note the work that ACRL is doing in this regard. Um, 
However, in my experience, few institutions are making serious attempts to carry out meaningful assessments of their programs. The second area I'd like to address is teaching and learning. As information professionals, librarians, information technologists, instructional technologists, media professionals, we need to make conscious choices on where our resources go to support teaching and learning. I believe, first and foremost, we need to focus on the educational mission of our institution and what we want students to gain from their education and not on systems. For me, the sweet spot for supporting students and their ability to move from college into fulfilling professional work is for librarians and information technologists to focus on integrating 21st century skills and understandings with a particular emphasis on creativity into students' course assignments, capstone projects, and theses in coordination with departmental faculty. Focusing on how information pro professionals can integrate important concepts about information into the curriculum was a large part of the thinking of the working group that developed the ACRL framework for information literacy, of which I was a part. In libraries at present, I believe a very large percentage of professional librarian time is spent on teaching basic information literacy skills to freshman English or equivalent classes. Information technology units in a number of institutions are spending significant sums of money along with a great deal of staff time on developing learning analytics systems, generally but not always, for introductory large enrollment STEM classes, particularly those with a ha that have had a poor pass rate in the past which in turn affects students' persistence at the university. While I do understand the importance of those kinds of programs, I would note that they are not particularly focused on developing 21st century skills or are encouraging creativity among students. Administrators, faculty, and information professionals need to make judgments as to where the emphasis should be in the services that we offer supporting teaching and learning. I believe we have a lot to bring to the conversation in terms of highlighting the importance of developing 21st century skills and emphasizing assignments <clears throat> that develop our students' creativity. There are a number of resources that provide guidance on learning goals. One that I find particularly useful is called the Degree Qualifications Profile, or DQP, developed by the National Institution for Learning Outcomes Assessment, or NILOA, along with the Lumina Foundation and others. Having the language to adapt and adopt in local institutions can be a useful way to begin conversations on what outcomes we want students to achieve in their learning. Here are two examples of what the DQP refers to as proficiencies. One, construct sustained coherent arguments in writing, okay, nothing new there, but then they add, and at least one other medium. That's the significant piece. The second, negotiates a strategy for group research or performance and com communicates the results. And we know how important team or group work is for 21st century workers. These images are from an undergraduate student project presented at Bucknell University's Digital Scholarship Conference last fall. The student used the Esri Story Map GIS software and data from the China Internet Network Information Center to create a visualization of the relationship between purchasing power per capita of each province in China to internet penetration. This is a student who was developing an academic argument in a different medium that included text but included many other things and help develop his 21st century skills. I've long admired the program developed at the Jones Media Center at Dartmouth, where information professionals work with faculty on developing video projects for class assignments. 
I highly recommend their website, which gives a wealth of information on the wide range of classes that they work with, and also includes testimonials from faculty and students. Here's what Professor Deborah Brooks of the Government Department had to say, I'm quoting. Using video projects within a competitive campaign simulation was an invaluable component of my political communication seminar. Beyond the study of campaign advertisements in scholarly articles and books, my students also created their own political ads. Through the process, they learned just how much information can be included in 30-second ads. They learned that information in this context goes well beyond words and includes potentially powerful music, sound effects, voiceovers, text, colors, photos, and video selections. As a result of this exercise, we were able to debate the roles of emotion, information, partisanship, strategy, the increasing professionalization of campaigns, ethics, and voter knowledge within a democracy in a far more dynamic manner than would have been possible otherwise. She continued, few of the students in the class had ever worked with video equipment or editing prior to this class, remember this is at Dartmouth, and all emerged from the course with near professional level work by the end. The quality of their assignments was truly impressive and was only possible with the training and support provided by Jones Media and RWIT, which is the combined program of the library, the writing center, and the academic computing at Dartmouth. Recently, Educause Review had an article on a framework called My Ways uh, uh, on creative competencies for student success in a world of change. One of their four domains is creative know-how, and you can see how the points in that area are so relevant to what we as information professionals do and can contribute to our students' education. At the Virginia Tech Library, they've been incrementally renovating spaces to develop a network of studios, which includes a 3D design studio, fusion studio, media design, 3D visualization, virtual environment, and data transformation. Patrick Tomlin, the director of learning environments for the library said, the studios exist because we believe that creativity is as critical a skill as literacy. We also believe that well-designed learning spaces can be tools to shape meaningful interactions, make innovation tangible, and spark community. Teaching and learning often involves students working in physical spaces, whether classroom, library, or other. As I transition to my final topic, spaces and places, I'd like to discuss what I see is a trend needing both examination and policy development. Cameras have been used to study utilization of space for a long time. In library settings, this usually requires IRB approval and posted signs alerting students or others to the presence of the cameras. Often the data collection is of a limited time and limited space of the library, so students don't want to be recorded. They'll go somewhere uh, to a different area. However, as more and more people believe that use of analytics in educational settings will provide the answers for achieving student success, we may see the development of more intrusive systems. And lest you think I'm being an alarmist, I'm now going to move to a quote from a Stanford professor who discussed his research in an interview in Inside Higher Ed recently. I'll bet a number of you saw this. He said, and I quote, I have very little doubt that tracking data from VR systems, how students move their heads, hands, and bodies during learning, can be used to predict retention of course materials and likely learning transfer when that material from class gets applied to the world. Indeed, my lab has provided preliminary data showing this capability. However, the privacy and policy implications of this are clearly vast, 
And there need to be tough conversations before a system that can categorize learners based on their body movements is implemented. He continued, imagine after 10 hours of body tracking, machine learning algorithms could predict with high accuracy what your final grade of a class would be based on thousands of students who came before you who'd contributed training data based on both body language during the instruction as input and final grade as output. Would you, as a student, want to know that result after the first month of class? Would you want your professor to know? And he also said, as far as I know, and I talk to policymakers about VR fairly often, there aren't many conversations ongoing. I was recently in a conversation with some architects and a university professor who's interested in monitoring students in learning spaces. By monitoring, she meant having students using wearable technology that would track their physical reactions that in turn had implications for things like psychological stress, things like measuring sweating of students. This, and this was purely conjectural, she's not actually conducting the research at this point, would be relayed, the data would be relayed to the faculty member who could monitor students enrolled during the class and monitor their emotional health. I asked her if she had given any thought as to what a faculty member might be expected to do if he or she perceived that the student was experiencing stress. Was the faculty member going to be trained in counseling or make sure that the student made an appointment at the campus counseling center? I also asked whether she thought that students would be comfortable having a faculty member know in real time what I would consider intimate deal details about their psychological state of being. She did not have answers, and I couldn't tell whether she'd even contemplated these issues, and that really surprised me. Fortunately, there's an excellent resources for, resource for campuses to use when developing policy related to student data and privacy issues. IMS Global has developed the data, um, data and analytics principles. We had a session on this at our last spring meeting, and there's a video of that session, and you can also access the full document on the IMS Global website. I urge you to consider going back to your home institutions and scheduling a conversation about this important work, either with your colleagues or as a university-wide conversation. So my final topic, are spaces still important? Why? The answer is yes. <laughs> Why are physical spaces still important in a technology-driven world? Students still need spaces where they can work together. They need access to specialized technologies and sometimes large screens. And they need access to expertise. At least for the near term, spaces will continue to play a key role in teaching and learning, and to some degree in research. Here we see a portion of the Digital Scholarship Center, the curve at Georgia State University, and the Digital Toolshed, an incubator for innovative digital research, teaching, and learning at the Claremont College's library. As information professionals plan new spaces or think through a space renovation, I believe that it's very important for planners to focus on what difference the spaces will make in learning and in research, rather than on the comfort, style of furniture, etc. After establishing the goals for the physical space, I'd encourage you to think about those principles from Europeana that I mentioned earlier. What activities are you deploying? Who do these benefit? How does this make a difference? And how do you measure that? The Learning Space Toolkit, developed by North Carolina State University and others, offers guidance on planning and assessment, and I served on their advisory committee. If we focus on what people will be able to do in our new and renovated spaces, 
It will make much more sense to our community, especially our faculty, than showing them photos of the nice furniture we plan to purchase. Smith College is gutting its library, renovating it, and planning an addition. And like most places, they've had some pushback from faculty, from some faculty. In preparation for the new facility and as a means to develop some sense of what kind of programming they might want to provide in the renovated facility, the library held a competition for mini grants in a space that they called and to host those experiments by students and faculty in a space they called the Knowledge Lab. One grant, one successful grant, was visualizing Russian feminism. In an article describing the program, Brendan O'Connell, a Smith librarian, and, disclosure, my son-in-law, <laughs> wrote, quote, the exhibit, which ran for a week in the Knowledge Lab, featured propaganda posters and other printed images, video clips, writing, and a slideshow of Russian feminist photography showcasing artistic expressions of female identity in Russia from the early revolutionary days of the Bolsheviks to the 21st century. The students also served authentic Russian food from a local restaurant to guests at a lively opening event. He continued, the event served as a powerful reminder of the value of making ideas about the new library concrete and real for our campus community. A faculty member who previously had not been enthusiastic about the library renovation project approached me during the exhibit opening and told me that seeing the students display their scholarship in the library was the first time she had been convinced that the library renovation was a good idea. I would also note how this project brought together 21st century skills and creativity. Places for digital scholarship are also important. At Brown, they initially thought that their first space, which is not shown in this photo, would be used by faculty members for the research. But they soon found that faculty were bringing their students, either as part of their team or their classes, to use the products of their scholarship. So they developed a second space, so they had more room for workshops, and also so they had a space where students could continue their project work outside of class time. At the University of Calgary, an in-depth user study of faculty involved in interdisciplinary work, and I consulted on that work, and Tom Hickerson has spoken about it at prior CNI meetings and at the Designing Libraries conferences, led to the renovation of space to form Lab Next, which extends the availability of high-end technologies and collaborative spaces in the Taylor Family Digital Library. You can visit that space if you come to the Designing Libraries Conference in this September. There's information in your packet about that. It's important to understand that beyond technology and direct relationship to specific courses, Libraries can play important functions for our students in providing a sense that they belong to a community. Hosting events such as this forum on fake news at the University of Rochester Library in a pop-up space in their renovated Lamb Square is an example. The library is a place for exchange of ideas and digging into information. Another part of developing community is to understand the variety of needs of different subgroups of the student population and understanding that some social or affective factors could have important ramifications for student success. Recently, University of Toronto's Robarts Library opened Canada's first academic library, Family Study Space. I know some US university libraries have had such spaces for some time. Providing break or lunch areas in digital scholarship center labs or other specialized spaces like graduate uh, areas and providing library cafes are mechanisms for developing communities where users can share information while engaging in social interaction. And last but not least, library spaces can continue to provide inspiration 
whether a modernized traditional James Mullins reading room, a surprisingly popular spot in the otherwise very model, mo modern and technology intensive Wilmoth Learning Center at Purdue University, or representations of manuscripts as murals in libraries at Connecticut College and University of Texas, or the art, digital and analog, that's an integral part of the Hunt Library at North Carolina State University. All of these mechanisms help to keep the user at the center of the place and space. So moving forward, I encourage all of you to continue to share what you're doing to create innovative programs and spaces that keep the user at the center at your own institution. Let me know what you're doing. Put in proposals for sessions at the CNI meeting. Invite me to your campus to see uh, what innovations you're preparing that will help make our information systems more coherent and understandable. Tell me about how you're working with faculty on integrating 21st century skills and creativity into the curriculum and show me some of the wonderful spaces that you're creating that encourage innovation, imagination, and community. Thank you. So the question is, how do we um, resolve maybe a tension between uh, wanting users to do creative things and try new technologies and et cetera, versus them maybe just wanting to be comfortable? Does that encapsulate it? Okay. So in most, fortunately, in most university or college libraries, there's, there is room for both. And I am, I never want to minimize the role of solo quiet study space in libraries because it's really the only building on campus where most students have access to that. It's just not the center of what I'm you know, focused on, but I still believe that it's very important. That isn't quite what you asked. Um, so let me then focus on the creativity and the innovation and use of technology. I'm really a firm believer that information professionals in general can't broadly speaking, um, make that happen for students. I am a big believer in this happening through assignments in their coursework. And that's why I think it's so important to work closely with faculty. Students just, um, now maker spaces may be the exception. We have many student clubs and other activities. We'll have a session at this meeting with at least one maker space as a really active, actually two, I think both of the, um, that I visited at Berkeley and at um, San Diego State. They have really strong student cohorts that uh, use the space in an extracurricular manner as well as some use related to the curriculum. Um, so that would be an exception, but I would say that working with faculty to help them um, understand the importance of 21st century skills and then working with them. And that's why I think this Jones Media Center, it's not the only one that ha does things like this, but they document it on their website. They'll, they'll give you a whole rubric for how they, a and a whole uh, development plan of how they work with faculty to, to create the assignments and then how they work with faculty to assess the student pro products. So that's what I would suggest. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, in your talk, when you have the three areas of discoverability, teaching and learning, and the places and spaces, it, it represents a transition away from collections as the center of what libraries do. And, and you talked about collections kind of indirectly in terms of open access and things like that. But I think it does represent a shift in thinking uh, away from a collection-centric model of uh, university libraries. And the teaching and learning and the discoverability don't assume that these are library collections necessarily. So I wonder if you could talk just more, more openly and directly about that shift in your brain. Let me see if I can represent that well. Um, I believe libraries need to focus like a level higher on the research, teaching, 
and learning and community mission of the university and not as a we build the collection because we're the library. So to me, the collection supports research, teaching, and learning, and in some cases, community. And so the shift in focus, there, it is definitely there. And what I'm saying is that actually, even in pre-technology days, in my view, it should have been there at that time. Now, there are a few libraries in every country, like Library of Congress, maybe Harvard and Yale and some others, that I do believe the collection, you know, this is a national cultural resource. But I personally believe that's a limited number who build the collection just for the collection's sake. I think it needs to be built for the research, teaching, and learning mission of the university. Now, in addition, just how that um, Dartmouth professor says, the students need images, sounds, videos, all of these things. And I find it very concerning how librarians focus so much on what they own and license. I don't think that's a positive thing. I, I think it is limiting the thinking of students or they may, they may just go around and think, well, you don't really know, you don't really understand what I need. And also working with classes where the primary function is to find the three journal articles takes time away from the classes, which I think is such a routine thing that it could be done in different ways, takes time away from these more creative assignments that may take more um, analysis and more discovery of all kinds of information resources. So you may not agree with me, and I'd be happy to have you push back, but that I think that may be my answer to your question. I, I actually totally agree, and I'm really glad to hear it <laughs> articulated that clearly, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, please. Hi, Jennifer Vinipal from The Ohio State University. Um, yes. So this is a question about trust um, in reaction to the stories that you told about the faculty who are thinking about collecting um, personal, very personal data from their students. Um, and as a, a parent of a 17-year-old who is extremely skeptical about institutionalized learning to such an extent that she's considering not going to college right now, um, I'm just wondering if you um, talk to students or have a sense from the faculty that you've been speaking to or the librarians, you know, we, we consider ourselves trusted resources. Um, and, you know, to, to what extent um, it's your sense that students w are, are um, horrified by or pushing back against um, th these kind, this kind of tracking and what, what that can do to our reputations um, as trusted places for, um, for sharing knowledge? Well, I think that's a great question, and my answer might surprise you. From my reading of the use of learning analytics in some institutions, particularly for the large enrollment STEM classes, my impression is that not only do students not particularly push back on it, but some of them are quite grateful. And they get things that some systems call nudges, you know, hey, you didn't do your reading or you haven't finished your problem set. And honestly, I find that I kind of flabbergasted it at the beginning. But part of my thinking has changed in that since we have such a broader population of students, we have many students, because a lot of these are for um, first year courses, a lot of students who haven't had the highly educated parents who kind of put them through their paces in high school, and I gather some as helicopter parents of students in college who are in fact keeping students on track. Now, myself and as a parent, my daughters are much older than, than yours at this point. Um, I felt um, after high school that was it, that my role in nudging was over. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, my personal philosophy is part of going to college is independence, learning to think for yourself, learning to um, budget your time, and making some mistakes 
is part of learning those life skills. But in some cases, in some student populations, and I'm, I want to be clear, I'm not saying those students aren't as good or as, or as uh, you know, it's more that they haven't had the same life experience and they may need more at, up front. And so my guess is that that's why this is okay. What I think is important is what's going to happen. I, I'm not as clear whether students always have a chance to opt out. And I have people talk about learning analytics that, well, if we don't get all the data, it's worthless. I've heard comments like that, which surprises me given methodology classes I've taken. I mean, who gets a 100% survey result, for example? But I, I haven't delved into the machine learning. I, I know nothing about the actual mechanics of creating algorithms and things like that. That's Cliff's area, not mine. And uh, so, so I, I don't know, but I, I think that is very important. But then comes the question, can the student really opt out? For example, if they need that course and it's only offered that way and there is no provision or they don't feel they can do it, do they really have that opportunity? And I think we need to be watchful of that. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> is that enough Thank of an answer? You. Thank you. Okay, I think that uh, we're probably ready to go to our next sessions. I think Cliff is going to come up and uh, Give us some final words. Just going to come up and say thank you very much. What a wonderful survey and synthesis. Um, thanks. Uh, and um, thank you also for just highlighting how, how much of a resource that website that we've got now represents for insights into this kind of thing. And so much of that, um, you know, I've got to say is really uh, you're doing in um, hel helping to uh, track the right sessions over the years and highlight them. Um, so thanks again for a tremendous talk. And I hope you all have a good uh, conference. I'll see you back tomorrow for the close. Thanks.